The scripture lesson today is found in Isaiah chapter 53. This happens to be my very most favorite Old Testament passage because within it are contained the central themes of the life of Christ and subsequently the Christian life with God. I love this cross. I hope now when I announce that we do this as something new on Easter, I hope this now makes a little more sense. At first, a few people seem not to fully understand. So what are you saying? We're going to glue flowers? You know, it seemed like it was a little new, a little different. I hope you see now, and the portrait that this paints is entirely consistent with the words of Isaiah 53. This is a part of what's known as the Song of the Suffering Servant. In Old Testament times in Israel, there were those who thought this was a portrait or a picture of the life of Israel in general. And then eventually, over the centuries, it became to be understood as being a prophecy from Isaiah concerning the Messiah. Specifically, all of these events, all of the things contained here, fulfilled in the life of Yeshua, of Jesus, of Nazareth. And here we see the Passion Week, don't we? In kind of art form, we see the pain and cruelty of the cross, the crown of thorns. And growing out of the crown of thorns, the closest thing I could find to the rose of Sharon by way of its color. Jesus having been the perfect rose crushed so that its fragrance of life might come out. He being the seed that was sown into the ground, as he said, that a seed has to fall and die and go into the earth, even as he did for three days, so that life and fruit could come forward, bursting out of it. This cross is at once a portrait of the pain and the sorrow and the suffering, not only of the cross, but of our lives. And also the beauty that is always mingled in as God never wastes an ounce of pain, a drop of tear, but uses them redemptively for his purposes in the world. Though mysterious, they are not hidden any longer. Isaiah chapter 53 describes the suffering servant, one aspect of the life of the Messiah, the Christ, the Christos, who was to come, who has come, who is coming again. Hear these words from the prophecy written so many centuries before they were fulfilled in the life of Christ. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. He was just a plain-looking guy. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Remember Jesus before Pilate? And he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in death. His tomb was borrowed from a rich man. 
though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Remember Pilate? This man has done nothing wrong. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life, the resurrection, and be satisfied, atonement, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. And finally, therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with transgressors. Remember, a thief on either side of the cross, this written hundreds of years prior to those events. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Blessed be the Lord at the reading of his word. And here are a few thoughts to encourage your heart today with regard to simply two ideas. A snapshot of fulfilled prophecy in Jesus Christ. I have not the time to go at length, but a snapshot of fulfilled prophecy in Jesus Christ and a snapshot of the evidence for the fact of his resurrection. My desire this and every Easter is to strengthen your trust in the reality of the resurrection. I met an old preacher one time. He was of a particularly, let's say, disinterested with the Bible persuasion after so many years and so much cynicism and having been schooled in a very old and very sort of dialectical method of understanding the Bible, that is, taking it as literature more than as reality. He said to me, I'm not saying the resurrection didn't happen. I'm just saying it's not an important part of the story. To which I replied, if that's not an important part of the story, why would I possibly live my life following after a dead man whom others claim to be alive? I would that you would avoid a similar kind of cynicism and relegate the resurrection to little more than a nice story or a good idea. Based on even the simplest snapshot of the fact of fulfilled prophecy and the facts of the historic evidence for the resurrection, I would that you would become like so many others have become, like the apostles, like Paul, like others, convinced of the resurrection and on the fact of the resurrection, build your life on the solid foundation, not on the sand and the shifting tides of man's philosophies. Adelaide Proctor wrote this little poem about a century and a half ago. She said this, If thou could trust, poor soul, in him who rules the whole, thou wouldst find peace and rest. Wisdom and sight are well, but trust is best. Why trust in the idea that a Jewish carpenter from an obscure backwater town not only came and spoke on behalf of God, but proved the fact that he had divine nature and origin by vacating a tomb after having been crucified to death by the Romans. Why do that? Here are just two reasons why. First, there is the fact of fulfilled prophecy. You see, it is presently rational, rational and eternally profitable to trust in Jesus Christ. It is presently rational to trust in Jesus Christ. The Messianic Jewish scholar Alfred Erdesheim found 456 Old Testament verses referring to Messiah or his time. 456, at least 300 of which can be said to be specifically, factually fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Here's just a couple. He was the promised offspring of Isaac. His lineage proves that. He was the heir to the throne of David. His lineage proves that. 
centuries before his birth, the man who would fulfill more than 300 specific prophecies also happened to be born in the town of Bethlehem, which was not even where he lived, was raised, or where his parents needed or necessarily made sense for them to be at the time of his birth. And yet there in the house of bread, the son of David was born of a virgin to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah 7, 4. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin, the Alma, the young maiden who had known no man, will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, Yeshua, the one who saves Predicted centuries before his birth in Jeremiah's prophecy was the slaughter of the infants, which occurred around the time of his birth, which is well attested to in historical record. His escape into Egypt, his ministry as a priest like Melchizedek, that is the Old Testament reference to him being of unknown origin and having divine influence and having always been a priest. So specific are the prophecies concerning Jesus that in Zechariah, the Bible says, I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And Judas, the betrayer, sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. That false witnesses would accuse him is predicted in Psalm 27, that he would be struck and spit upon is predicted right here in Isaiah chapter 50. Three, that he would be silent when accused. We just read it. That he would be hated without a cause. That he would suffer vicariously. That he would be crucified with sinners. It was predicted that Jesus would be crucified, do you know, before the Romans used crucifixion as a means of torture and death. Most notably, though, in my way of thinking at least, are the parallels between Isaac and Jesus. This manner of prophecy is not timeline prophecy. It's what we might call typology or type prophecy. There in the life of Abraham and Isaac, you recall the account, Abraham is told by God to take his son, his son of the covenant, the son whose name means laughter, both because his wife laughed when the angel said that she would give birth because she was an old woman, and then also because it was a joyous event when this aged woman, well past childbearing years, became pregnant with Isaac. So God had given him the son of his promise finally and said all the nations would be blessed of whom we are accounted a part of that promise and its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And then Abraham, after all these long many years, after all of his mistakes, after everything he did wrong, he finally has the son. We don't know. The text doesn't say how old he was, although it does say he was old enough to know what was going on. He said, you take your son and you're going to sacrifice him. And there in the Genesis record, it says the day that it occurred, three days prior, because it was a three days journey to Mount Moriah, to the place where Isaac was to be sacrificed, the very place where Jesus was sacrificed. There, he says, get up and take him, go to this place, and there you're going to bind your son, you're going to sacrifice him. And we think Abraham must have just had the most brilliant faith. He must have just trusted no matter what God said or did. He never had any angst. He was such a great saint. Not so. What does the text say? On the morning that they were to depart, it says he woke up early. I've given great thought to that over the years. Why did he get up early? Was he just an early riser? Why does the text say something like that? No. He probably couldn't sleep. So he got up early. Took a three-day journey. Got to the place. Went to make the sacrifice. His son, who was at least old enough to know what was going on, says, where's the sacrifice, Dad? He says, God will provide it. Both Isaac and Abraham and Jesus as the Messiah fulfilled promises. Both were the only son of their father, that is the covenant son. Both had a miraculous birth. Both 
had a pre-announcement of their birth by angelic hosts. Both were named before their birth, one meaning to laugh or joyous, the other meaning to rescue or God saves. That's what Yeshua means, God saves. Both were named before their birth. Both were mocked and persecuted by their kindred. Both were undeserving of their sacrificial death. Both were sacrificed near the same place. Both were loved by their fathers. Both had a three-day experience. Jesus in the tomb. Isaac on the way. Both carried their own wood, and I've always found this to be the most shocking and striking parallel between the two accounts, which exist hundreds of years prior to them. Abraham, having been told to sacrifice his own son, commands his son to gather the wood for the fire. And it must have been about this time that Isaac starts to wonder, what's going on? He gathers his own wood that's going to be the fire to make his own sac himself the sacrifice, though unknowingly. Just as Jesus carried the crossbeam of the cross along the Via de la Rosa in Jerusalem, the crossbeam weighing probably around 200 pounds, carrying the weight of the world figuratively and in a sense literally, both submitted to their father, Isaac, willing to lay down his life, Jesus going all the way. Both had a question of their father. Now Isaac asked Abraham, here is the fire and the wood, father, but where is the lamb? Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At the very moment that the full weight of your sin and of mine was placed upon his shoulders, what fools we are to judge others, to judge ourselves as though we are better than anybody else. When the beautiful promise is, is that the whole weight of the whole world's sin was there on the shoulders of Messiah. Both were brought back from the dead. Isaac was brought back figuratively because the angel screamed to Abraham, don't lay a hand on your son. And Jesus, after the resurrection, the prophecies are many. And that well is far too deep to plummet any further this morning. And the fact of the resurrection is well attested. And I'm going to give you just these facts that the well-known apologist Dr. Gary Habermas wrote in his book on the resurrection, Gary Habermas having earned his PhD from the University of Michigan in philosophy, a man respected in the secular world as a brilliant scholar, and he happened to be my apologetics professor at Liberty Seminary. So I am very well acquainted with this argument of his, and I'm going to share it with you briefly. Here are the facts of the resurrection that are accepted not just by crazy Christian people like me and you, but by secular scholars who attest to the reality at least of this, though they would deny any supernatural uh, connection to it. Here are the facts of the resurrection that are accepted by skeptic scholars and followers of Jesus alike. Jesus died by crucifixion. The best scholarship proves that Jesus was in fact a real man who really lived, who died by crucifixion. He was buried. His death caused the disciples to lose heart, to despair. The tomb was empty. Only the skeptical scholars say the disciples must have stolen him out of the tomb. That's right. The sad and lonely and feeble and weak and hiding disciples beat up a couple of the equivalent of United States Marines in those days, rolled a giant tomb, out of, a giant stone out of the way, grabbed Jesus, and then paraded his dead body around so that 500, the Bible says, could be convinced that he was resurrected. Fantastic argument. Another argument on the part over the centuries of skeptical scholars was that Jesus, after enduring the crucifixion, after having his legs broken to prove that he was dead because eventually someone died largely of blood loss and suffocation from difficulty of breathing with your arms spread out this way, Jesus, when he was laid in the tomb, this is called the swoon theory, when he was laid in the tomb, he wasn't exactly dead. And the coolness of the tomb made him wake up. And after having been beaten, hung on a cross, his legs broken, then Jesus stood up, pushed a giant stone out of the way, 
beat up two Roman centurions, United States Marines of their day, then went to the house of the disciples and he said to the disciples, hey guys, look, I'm alive. They would not have hailed him as a resurrected king. They would have gotten Luke and said, the man desperately needs a doctor. That's not what would have happened. The disciples had experiences which they believed were literal appearances of the resurrected Jesus. Eleven disciples had experiences of the resurrected Jesus. One ancient theory suggests that it was mass hallucination. Some of your generation grew up in the 60s. And I'll not ask you to raise your hands if you experimented with any psychedelic drugs. Now, I can tell by the chuckles that you're glad no hands must be raised, perhaps. Has anyone ever had a really bad fever that caused a hallucination? Maybe you know someone who experimented with psychedelic drugs. Maybe you've had some other reason, a lengthy fast or so on, to experience hallucination. Have you ever woken up half in a dream state, half in an awake state, and hallucinated something? Is it even possible for two people to experience the exact same hallucination, much less 11. I would suggest to you it is not. The disciples were transformed from doubters to bold proclaimers. The resurrection was central to their message. They preached the message of Jesus' resurrection in Jerusalem. These are historic accounts. Orthodox Jews who believed in Christ made Sunday their primary day of worship. James the family brother and skeptic of Jesus was converted and became one of the greatest evangelists in church history. And most notably, Paul, who was a persecutor of the church, had an experience with the resurrected Savior and went from being the chief persecutor to the chief proclaimer of Jesus Christ to the world. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, surely we never would have heard of him. The attitude of the women was that they had come to pay the last tribute to a dead body. The attitude of the disciples was that everything had finished in tragedy. By far the best proof of the resurrection is the existence of the Christian church. And by far the greatest part of that message is Jesus is not a figurative part of a moral lesson. He is a living presence. Jesus is not a memory. He is alive today. Christianity isn't knowing about Jesus. It's knowing Jesus. And Christianity has an endless life that you and I can gain access to because at the moment of his death, the Bible records that the veil which separated men from the holy of holies in the temple was torn asunder from top to bottom which opened up the way to knowing god in jesus christ it unlocked the gate it left the door wide open for us to enter much like i had done for ephraim serber last night now, yesterday, Ephraim was out with a friend of his, and he was out with a friend, and he was with their father, and they were doing this, that, and the other thing, and he was to come home kind of late. I knew that much. So I knew he'd be home late, but I had to go to bed early because I have church today. So my wife and I laid down in bed, and before we did, I unlocked the door, the front door. I unlocked it. Now, my 16-year-old son, Sebastian, his bedroom is right there, next to the front door. The door was unlocked. Ease of entry. Ease of entry. No problem. The door was unlocked because I'm a very conscientious man and so is my wife, a conscientious woman, and we care for our children. So we left the door unlocked so that they could come in. And around about midnight or so, when he finally got home, which was okay, we knew he was going to be out, went to the movies and did this, that, and the other thing, he came home and his brother's bedroom is just right there. And you know what's inside his brother's bedroom? the part of the doorbell thing that makes all the sound. So the door was unlocked. I knew Ephraim was about to be home. And I heard this. (laughs) 
And then half a second later, ding dong, ding dong. And Sebastian, who's kind of a night owl and has been not sleeping great the last few nights, but last night had fallen asleep early, woke up. And my wife said, I only heard it from upstairs. My wife said he came out, huh, huh, what the heck's going on? Like ready for a fight, like somebody's breaking into the house because the ding dong thing is like only several feet from his bed. <sighs> the door was unlocked. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I say all of that because one, I love embarrassing my kids when they give me the permission and for the record, he allowed me to tell that story. And secondly, to simply illustrate this, one essential truth of the Christian faith, Christianity is not a story about Jesus, it's the story of knowing God in Christ. Christianity is not the account or the story of second chances by way of a pretty story about somebody coming back from the dead. No, it is a factual, historical account based on fulfilled prophecy, which was promised centuries prior to the birth of Christ, and then the facts of the resurrection. Don't you see? Christianity is a living way. Jesus is alive. When we say he is risen, we're not saying, hey, you can have second chances. We're saying Jesus Christ rose from the dead, vacated the tomb. The door's unlocked. And the love of God in Christ is so radical. It's so unending. It's so unimaginably brilliant and beautiful that the only thing necessary to access it is the opening of an unlocked door, which ain't much. God offered his son because of grace, and he gives new life through faith, which is simply turning our eyes in the direction of Jesus, opening our hands and our hearts, and saying, I'll live in him if he'll have me, and he will have you.